Everybody get your Bibles. Get your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel and go ahead and look at chapter number 15. 1 Samuel chapter number 15. That's where we will be in the text in just a moment as we introduce the text. 1 Samuel chapter 15. The lesson means so much more to you if you're reading the text for yourself as we go through. As is on the board, we note that sin causes the Spirit of the Lord to depart. Kendra just read just a moment ago that, that the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. There's a photograph in the background there. It's, it's a picture I found of Saul, King Saul. He's got his, his head resting in his hands and he's so sad because God allowed an evil spirit to come upon him because the Spirit of the Lord had departed from Saul. But the second part of that statement is righteousness draws the Spirit of the Lord. As he just read also that Samuel took the horn of oil and he anointed David. And David was blessed. So as we sin, the Spirit of the Lord departs from us. But as we do righteous deeds, the Spirit of the Lord gets closer and closer. You know, the Bible talks about in Galatians chapter number 5. It talks about the, the works of the flesh and how that that is wicked and it leads us astray. It leads us into places we don't need to be. But then in that same chapter, he talks about the fruits of the Spirit. And there's, there are things like joy and peace and so forth. So if we have the fruits of the Spirit, that means that the Spirit is with us and, and, we, and, and we know that because of the fruits of the Spirit, it's in our life, then it's indicative that we are drawing closer to God. But if the works of the flesh is prevalent in life, and we are out there doing what the flesh dictates that we do, then the Spirit of the Lord tends to get away from us, and we, we tend to open up for, for evil things to come upon in our lives. James chapter number 4, verse 7 and 8 puts it this way. He says that if we will submit to God, that is the, the primary thing to do, is submit yourselves to God. He says, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, we could just stop right there, and we could say, well, all we've got to do is just say no. If the devil is, is tempting us to do a work of the flesh, uh, there's something in our flesh, thievery or adultery or, or lying or stealing or whatever it is, and it's in our flesh to do that, then all we got to do is just, just bow up and say, Satan, no, I resist you, and then Satan will run away. That's not the context of that verse. Well, I can't resist Satan to the point that he'll run away from me. It's impossible to do so. But why? Because Satan has been around so much longer than I uh, and so much longer than you. He's got more power. He's got more, more knowledge. He knows the three tools, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life that he can hit me with and he can hit you with. So if I just stand with my chest out and I poke it up in the devil's chest and I say, I resist you, Satan, I'll just say no. He will squash me under his thumb like, a, like I could squash an ant. The rest of that verse in James chapter number 4, verse 8 says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. That's the only way to truly resist Satan is to get closer to God. We think, well, I don't have to go to church. All I've got to do is I can stay at home and I can, I can be just as close to God at home and, and I can resist the, all the devil and all of his, his, his tools and I don't need to get any closer to God. Then you're missing the point of James chapter 4. The only way that I can truly resist Satan is to draw nigh to God. Why? Because the closer I get to God, the Bible says in James chapter 4 verse 8, He will draw nigh to me. So the closer I go to God, the closer He comes to me. And the closer He gets to me, the more fearful Satan is. Because Satan cannot defeat God. Satan cannot have a chance against God. That's why he will flee from me. Not because he can. Uh, I'm so strong and I can say no so much. No, it's because God is with me. God is with you. 
And when God is with us, Satan has no place, and he will flee from us. So these concepts, when I choose to sin a work of the flesh, I get further away from God. And when I get further away from God, His Spirit departs from me. I'm further away. And I'm prone for Satan to pounce on me and destroy me and devour me. But when I do right, when I submit to God, I do His will. The closer I get to God, the closer His Spirit comes to me. That's the concept. Now let's look at the prime example, at least for me, in the Bible of where this happened. 1 Samuel chapter number 15. Everybody go there. In chapter number 15, prior to chapter 15, the people said, we want a king. You know, we've had judges and, 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 and we followed after the judges and sometimes we did, sometimes we didn't. But we're looking around at all of the other neighboring countries. We want to be more like the, the neighbors. They've got kings. We want a king. And God said, you don't need a king. Ah, God, I'm your king. So you don't need to follow after a, a fleshly man king. And they persisted. And finally, God said, okay, I'll give you a king. So he told Samuel to go and anoint this guy. He stood head and shoulders above everybody. His name was Saul. Oh, a, a good-looking guy, a prime guy, a fine guy. And God anointed him to be the king, the first king of all of Israel. And as he made his travels. He came upon some prophet, and the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord came upon Saul. And Saul began to do things like the prophets did. And they even questioned, is Saul among the prophets? Because the Spirit of the Lord was with him. But as time drew more and more closer to the, he's king now, he got all the power of a king, and, 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 and all of a sudden, his, his inner flesh starts working him. And he starts making decisions on his own. God told him to go down to the Amalekites. This is found in 1 Samuel chapter 15. And here's what I want you to do. They're so wicked. Their sins have come up before me. I want you to destroy everything. I want you to destroy all the cattle, all the sheep. I want you to destroy the men and women and children. I want you to destroy the king. I want you to destroy everything. Not one living thing. I want you to go and do that. Well, he did go down there. But the Bible says... In verse number 9 of 1 Samuel 15, Saul and his people spared Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and they spared the best of the sheep, and they spared the oxen and the fatlings and the lambs and, and all that was good, everything that they liked, that pleased their eyes, that pleased their flesh. And they would not utterly destroy them. God told them to do it, but they would not do it. But everything that was vile and refuse, garbage, that they destroyed utterly. In other words, God made, or God told Saul to destroy everything. Saul went in there and he said, you know what? The lust of my flesh, the lust of my eyes, the pride of my life is going to dictate to me to spare certain things and only do what God says do in certain areas. And that was totally displeasing to God. Look at... Verse number 10. Then came the word of the Lord to Samuel. And here's what God said to Samuel. It repenteth me. Look at verse 11. It displeased God so much. It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king. For he is turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. So when I, as a sinner, I decide that I'm going to allow the works of my flesh to overwhelm the works of righteousness, doing what's right, then I displease God. Just like God was so displeased with Saul. He said, it repenteth me. I, I, I just wished I hadn't made him king. That's the idea. Uh, I would li I'd like to go back on that. That's what repentance is. You go in one direction. When you repent, you go in another direction. So what God is saying, I'm going to change directions for Saul. He was close to me at one time. Uh, my spirit was upon him at one time, but because he chose to sin, he became a sinner, then I'm going to turn from him. It repenteth me that I have made him king. So, if I choose a life of sinfulness as opposed to a life of righteousness, I displease God. 
Secondly, in the rest of that verse, I grieve my fellow saints, my fellow brothers and sisters. Look at the rest of that verse. It grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Folks, if I make a decision to go off into this world and do something that is unrighteous for the lust of my flesh or the pride of my life or the lust of my eyes, it will break your heart, will it not? How many of you have ever cried over someone you love so dearly that have left the Lord? I can think of people in my heart and my mind over the years. It breaks my heart to see them out there living unrighteously, not, not worshiping God, uh, participating in things that I know God is so displeased with. It grieves me. It breaks my heart. It'll break your heart. It breaks my heart when you're not here. You know, and I know maybe you're not here because you're sick and you can't help it. And you're, but still, you know, oh man, I wish they were here today. I, I, I miss them so bad. But what if you're not here because you have left God? You've turned your back on Jesus. And you've taken His blood and you threw it on the ground and you stepped on it. And you say, I don't want a part of that anymore. That would crush your brothers and sisters and the folks who are righteous before God. Samuel was a prophet of God. And it said that he grieved him when Saul displeased God in sin. And he cried all night long. So when our sin is upon us, it grieves other, not just God, it grieves the folks. And it causes us to be blind. Sin will blind us. Look at verse number 13. Well, in verse number 12, going up to verse 13, Samuel arose early. He went to meet Saul in the morning. It was told Samuel, saying that Saul came to Carmel. And behold, he set him up a place, and he's gone about and passed on and, and gone down to Gilgal. So, so Samuel has to go hunting him. He, he was grieved. He cried all night because he had went away from God. And so he goes out hunting him. And when he finds him, look at verse 13. Samuel came to Saul. Knowing what he had done now. And Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. Oh, Samuel, you're a good guy. You're a man of God. Blessed be thou of the Lord. Listen, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. He had not performed the commandment of the Lord. He saved Agag and the choice of sheep and cattle and only destroyed what he wanted to. He hadn't performed the commandment of the Lord, but yet he was so blind to his sin that he told the man of God, I've done it. I've done what God wants me to do. There are people living out there today that are living their lives in such a way that they're, they've gotten so blind to it. They, they don't see what they're doing wrong. They can't see the people that they've hurt. They can't see the sins that they're committing. They can't see the commandments that they're breaking. Why? Because the further they get away from God, the further God's Spirit leaves them. They're getting into a hardness of heart and a blindness in their life. And it causes them to blame other people. When Samuel is going to point it out to him, you haven't done it. He starts to blame. Look at verse number 14 leading into 15. Samuel said, you, you, you've kept the commandments of the Lord? Well, then what meaneth then this bleating, the bleating of the sheep? They're, they're buying and they're calling. He said, what does that mean in my ears? And the lowing of the oxen, the mooing of the cows, which I hear. If you've really kept the word of God, you would have killed those sheep. You would have killed those cows, but you didn't. So if you really kept the commandments of God, then what's the, the evidence says you haven't. And then here's what Saul said. They, the folks, have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen. Oh, it's not my fault, Samuel. Oh, Samuel, no. I'm, I'm involved here, but, but, but you can't blame me. I'm going to blame brother so-and-so. You know, the reason I don't come to church, like, like I know I ought to, but, 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 but I'm not going to go to church because brother so-and-so said such and such to me. And hurt my feelings so, so bad. And I'm not going to go to church as long as brother so-and-so is sitting there. What are they doing? 
They're trying to justify their own lifestyle of unrighteousness because they're blaming someone else. It's not the other folks' problem. It's his problem. But he goes to blaming the other folks. And we do that. Why? Because the lust of our flesh and the lust of our eyes and the pride of our life starts to work on us. And the, and the more it works on us, the works of the flesh, the further we get away from God. And the further we get away from God, the further that spirit comes. And then we become to, uh, open up to the evil spirit that Saul is opening himself up to. To blame other people for our indiscretions. And then, he begins to make excuses. Oh, well, this is the reason that I did this, that, and the other. Continuing on in verse 15. He says, they did this to sacrifice sheep. And the, and the oxen, they, they did this to sacrifice to the Lord God. And, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. So, you know, really, I haven't done really bad. Uh, the reason I saved the sheep and the reason I saved the oxen is to worship God with it. What an excuse. What an excuse. The reason I'm not worshiping God at church is because is I'm worshiping out on the river. Or I'm doing something other, that, uh, I'm doing something good out here in life. Hold on. Are you making an excuse for not worshiping God? Are you making an excuse for not keeping God's commandments? Saul did. Made excuses. Then said Samuel unto him, Saul, stay. Look at verse 16. I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said, and then we'll say on. So, Samuel says, Saul, I'm going to tell you what God told me to tell you. And here it is. And Saul said, okay, tell me. Say on. Here it is. Samuel said, when thou was, a, was little in thine own sight, you wasn't a king. You wasn't anybody. You was nobody. You was lost in your sin. You was little in your own sight. Wast thou not made the head of tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed the king over Israel? Didn't God take you from being little all the way up to being something great? He was of the tribe of Benjamin, which was the smallest tribe of all the Israel. And yet now you're king of all of Israel. Didn't God do that for you? And look at verse 18. The Lord sent thee on a journey. And he said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners of the Amalekites and fight against them until they be consumed. You know, God is the reason that you're so important and you're so powerful. And all God asks you to do is go do something for Him. Wherefore? Why? That's what he said in verse 19. Why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? But didst thou fly upon the spoil and dis evil in the sight of the Lord? You didn't do what God asked you to do. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, yea, Samuel, hold up, hold on, yes, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. What? He, even though Samuel put him straight to him and said, You didn't do what God says do. You were nobody and God made you great and now you're not obeying God. Folks, you were sinners, lost, going to go to hell. God sent His only begotten Son to die for your sins on a cross. And you believed that, and you repented of your sins, you confessed your sins, you were baptized into Christ, and you rose to walk a new life, and you know what you're doing? You're not walking that new life. You're out there following sin, corruption, unrighteousness. No wonder you're getting further and further away from God. And when Saul is confronted by Samuel... You're getting further away from God, Saul. You're not obeying the voice of God. He turns around, oh, but I have obeyed the voice of God. He, he reiterates it. He hangs on to it and he, and he tries to excuse himself. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and I have gone by the way which the Lord sent me. I'm doing what God asks me to do. No, you haven't. You're blind. You're making excuses. You're blaming other people. Look at verse number 20, continuing. I brought Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and I've utterly destroyed the Amalekites. That's all, you know. But it's not my fault. Look at verse 21. But the people, he continues to go back to blaming others. The people took the spoil. They took the sheep. They took the oxen and the chief things which should have been utterly destroyed. They, I agree. I should have utterly destroyed them. But it's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault is the reason I'm living an unrighteous life. To sacrifice, though, now let me give them a little excuse. It was to sacrifice to the Lord the God. You know, it was for a good reason that we're doing this wrong thing. Folks, as we talked about in class this morning, the end does not justify the means. 
Just because we're going to do it for the, oh, I'm going to do it for this good reason over here. But then you live unrighteously before God? No, that doesn't work. But sin will be punished. It will happen. Verse number 22, Samuel said to Saul, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice? You're going to take these sheep and sacrifice them to the Lord. You think that makes it all all right? Does the Lord prefer the sacrifices over obedience? He says, does he have delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? He told you to kill him and you didn't. He would rather you obey his voice than to make up justification for what you did wrong. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken or to listen to God and obey His voice. That's better than the fat of rams. You should have killed those sheep. You should have killed those oxen. You should have did what God says do. For rebellion. That's what you are, Saul. You're in rebellion. You're getting further away from God. Rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. You might as well practice sorcery and witchcraft. Because you're going in an unrighteous works of the flesh direction. Your stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. You're being stubborn. And you're not obeying the voice of God. You might as well be worshiping a false god. Somebody say, oh, I'd never worship a false god. I would never bow down my my, uh, knees to an idol. Ever would I do that. But now, I, I will do this thing over here. I will sin in this way, or I will uh, forsake the assembly, or I will not take the Lord's Supper, or I will not do this other stuff. You know, I'm not going to do any of that. But I'd never, I'd never bow down to a false statue. Well, you might as well. That's what he said. You might as well. It's all, it, it, it's just, it's just, if you reject, you rejected him. He said, because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee from being king. The further you get away from God, the further He gets away from you. And it will prompt us as sinners, the further away we get away from God, realize that, you know, it'll promise, prompt us to, to, to beg for forgiveness. And that's exactly what Saul does. In verse 24, Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, I, okay, I've, I haven't done what God says do, I've transgressed the law. For I have transgressed the commandments of the Lord, I admit that, and thy words, I didn't do what you told me to do, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. See, he's still reaching into that blaming. Uh, It's their fault, really. But, you know, I'll accept that I didn't do it. Now, therefore, because I admitted that I didn't do what God says do, I pray thee, I'm begging you, pardon my sin. Forgive me of what I did wrong. Turn again with me, Samuel. Get back on my side. Stay with me. Get close to me again. Why? That I may worship the Lord. I want to get close to God again. See, I'm over here and I realize that and He's over there and I want to get back close to Him. See, please forgive me. But look at verse 26. Samuel said in the Saul, I will not return with thee. I'm not going to get back to you. I'm not going to be back on your side. For thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. Samuel saw right through him. Saul was not genuine. Saul was not, was not sincere, as we'll see in a moment, about getting back with God. Oh, he just wanted back with God uh, so that the people would like him again. He wanted Samuel on his side. Let me get close to the church members so that everybody out here think I'm something special and I'm, I'm pretty holy. That's his, that's his reasoning. Samuel said, I'm not going to return. You've rejected God. You've thrown him out. Look at verse number 27. As Samuel turned about to go away, as he was leaving Saul, he, Saul, laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. He, it tore. He said, please, Samuel, come back, come back. And Samuel walked around, and he ripped his clothes. And as soon as he did, verse 28 says, Samuel said to Saul, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day. He's taken away the kingdom from you. He's tore it from you. Just like you tore my clothes, He's torn the kingdom from you. And He's going to give it to a neighbor of thine that is better than you. He's going to give it to somebody that's righteous, somebody that's close, somebody that has the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is departing from you. 
He's going to give it to somebody close to him. And we're going to see who that is in a moment. And also the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. He's made up his mind and he's, he's, he's going to do what he said he's going to do. And then we find out that Saul is not really sincere. Look at verse number 30. Then he said, Saul said to Samuel, Oh, I have sinned, yet honor me now. See, it's all about Saul. Oh, honor me now. I beg you, before the elders of my people. See, I'm really not genuine. I'm really not sincere. The only reason I want you to, to put me back in good grace with you is so that the elders will look at me and think I'm sincere. And the people will look at me and think that I'm sincere. But he's really not sincere. Honor me in the sight of the folks. And before Israel, turn again with me. Get back on my side. Why? That I may worship the Lord. Now, the Bible says in verse 31 that Samuel did turn with him. But it was not God's will for that to happen. Because we're going to see that it began to hinder God's work. Look down in verse 35. Samuel came no more to see Saul. See, he stayed with him for a little bit, but he came no more to see Saul. He, he went back with him no more. Until the day of his death. He didn't see him anymore until he died. Nevertheless, even though he didn't see Saul anymore until the day that he died, nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul. Oh, I'm, he's still sad. Saul has rejected and he's gone and I'm so sad about that. And the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. God said, look, Saul's out of here. Saul's gone. And look at chapter 16, verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul? How long are you going to cry for the guy that's left me, that's rejected me? How long are you going to cry? You're hindering my work. He says, Seeing I have rejected him, he's out of here. He's gone from reigning over Israel. So fill thy horn with oil. Samuel, get back to work. Fill your horn, that's what they carried the oil in, with oil, and go. Get busy. Go to somebody else. I'm going to send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided me a king among his sons. And one of his sons is David. So God, Samuel is so sad, he stopped working. He's so worried about Saul. Oh, Saul, you're out there in the world. Oh, I'm so sad about that. Oh, please come back. I wish he would. I wish he could. But God says, stop it, Samuel. You got other people to go see. You got other people to knock on their doors. You got other people to invite. Saul has rejected me. He's done. His spirit is gone from me. And I've got other people that I want to be drawn near to me. And as Kendrick read in just a little moment ago, in chapter 16, verse 13, Samuel did take that horn of oil. Chapter 16, verse 13, he anointed him in the middle of his brethren. The Spirit of the Lord came upon David. So the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, but it came upon David. And from that day forward, Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. And an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. So the further you get into this kind of activity where you're blaming folks, you're blind to your sin, even, even when you beg forgiveness, it may be too late. There's going to be a day that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, and everybody will be begging God to forgive him. Too late. Too late. Too late. The Spirit of the Lord has departed from you because you left me. I want people that are righteous. I want people that, that are close to me. And I'll draw nigh to them. Because he said, get your horn, Samuel. Fill it with oil. Go get me a righteous person. And he did. He got David. And in chapter 16 through 20, as we bounce through, David enjoys great peace. In chapter 16, verse number 21, David came to Saul. He stood before Saul. And he loved him greatly. Here's what's happening. The evil spirit that Saul, he's, he's depressed. He's done. He said, oh me, this is bad. I've gotten so far away from God and God's not blessing me anymore. And the, the fruits of the spirit are not with me. There is no joy. There is no happiness. There is no meekness. There is no gentleness. I am 
I'm so far away from God. But then he brought little David in. And he, and he recognized the Spirit of the Lord's on David. And he wants to be close to him. He, he fell in love with David. And, da- and Saul sent to Jesse saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me. He's found favor in my sight. Let me tell you what happens. Those people that get so far away from God, they begin to wish that they were more like those people that are close to God. Look at them. They're happy. Look at them. They have joy. Look at them. They understand gentleness and meekness and all the fruits of the Spirit. I want to be with them. I want to get close to them because they realize they've come so far away from God. Please let me get close back to God. And I'll do it through the folks. But they're not genuine. Because they don't really glorify God. In chapter 17, or chapter 17, verses 36 through 37. Skip over there. 1 Samuel 17, beginning at verse 36. The servant slew both the lion and the bear. This is when Goliath came up. And Saul was looking for somebody to go kill Goliath. And David, whom Saul loved, and he really wanted to be close to him because he could see the Spirit of the Lord upon him, David come up and said, you know what? I killed a lion, and I killed a bear to save my sheep. I can kill this Goliath. I can do it because God allowed me to do it. He says in verse uh, 36, This uncircumcised Philistine shall be just like one of them, a lion or a bear seeing he hath defied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, The Lord delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear. And he, the Lord, will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go and the Lord be with you. He could see that God was with David. And David was giving God all the glory for everything that happened to him. But Saul had gotten so far from God that he couldn't give God the glory. He wanted the glory for himself, but he wanted to get it close with David. So that's why in chapter 18, verses 5 through 12, this is the scene where David had gone out and killed many Philistines. And the women were singing a song. David, David, you know, he's great. Saul, Saul, he's killed his thousands. But David, David, tens of thousands. He was getting all the praise and the glory. He was giving it to God. Now God's doing this, not me. David understood that. He's genuine. But Saul's not genuine. Because when he saw that David was getting praise and glory, he became so jealous. Because he wanted the praise. He wanted the glory. He was so mad. Look what these women are doing. Only attributing me a thousand and attributing David Tens of thousands. He got so angry that he tried to murder David. That's what happens. People who are so far from God, they want, they want what a Christian has. They want to be close to the Christian, but they're not genuine. They're not giving God the glory. They want the glory. They get jealous. And they may even try to kill you. That's exactly what Saul did to David. He tried to throw a javelin at him and kill him. And even this happened. In chapter number 20, Beginning at verse 30, Saul's anger was killed against Jonathan. Jonathan is Saul's son. David was enjoying a great relationship with Saul's son, Jonathan. They were so close. Jonathan would die for David. He loved him just that much. And when Saul saw that Jonathan and David were close... He became so infuriated. I don't want you to be around, David. You're my son. You do what I say. And at one point, he picked up a javelin and tried to kill Jonathan. He lost his own relationship with his son because of his jealousy and his cause of his insincerity and his lack of being genuine. He had gotten so far from God that he would even try to kill those that were close to Christians. And close to people of God. Folks, sin will take you so far from God. It will cause us to do so much that we would thought we would never do. And the Lord will depart from us. The Bible says that He could send a, a delusion. That you can even believe a lie. 
or that your heart can come so hard that it will, it will be seared over like a hot iron searing something over, calloused. We don't want to get to that position. Saul had gotten to that position. He, the further he got away from God, the further God got away from him. He, he rejected him. But David, on the other hand, was righteous. And he got closer and closer to God. Did David sin? Sure David sinned. He made many mistakes. But what did he do? Every time he come back to God. He repented. And as closer he got to God, the closer God got to him. Question is, how close am I to God? Am I keeping His commandments? Sometimes I, I get a little depressed. I think, well, God, I feel bad. I don't feel close to you. And it may be just because I'm going through a season. Maybe the sun hasn't shone. Or maybe some relationships that I had has, has been taxed. Maybe that's what's happening to me. I don't know. But I do know this. If I stop praying, if I stop worshiping, if I stop reading the Bible, if I stop having relationships with fellow Christians, if I stop getting closer and closer to God, then all of those spirits of depression and sadness and not enjoying my walk in life, it could be that I'm getting further and further and further away from God. And I don't want to get to that point. I want to turn around and get close to God. Now, does that mean that I'm always going to be happy, that I'm always going to be jumping for joy? And No, Paul found himself in prison, being beaten. That can happen. But they know, Paul said, I have learned to be content, whatever situation I'm in. Why? Because I'm close to God. Are you close to God today? If you've gotten away from God, I'm we all are here. We're going to sing this invitation song. And what we're doing, we're encouraging you to say, I need to get back on track. And I do realize that I have gotten away from God. And I can just sense the Spirit of the Lord has gone for me. I'm not as close as I need to be. All you have to do is come forward and say, God, I'm sorry. If we wait till we get to the spirit that Saul had, where we're only saying we're sorry just to get the, the pat on the back from the elders, or just to get the pat on the back from the fellow Christians, if that's the only reason we're coming to church, we're already possibly too far gone. Is your heart broken? Do you need to come back? Today's the day. Why don't you come? Why together we stand and sing. Who is standing? Patiently drawing.